I want to say a good evening to everyone. Welcome to Odysseys, Ithaca Writers on Exile, Wandering, and Searching for Home. I'm Jonathan Miller, board chair of Ithaca City of Asylum, and it is just great to see you all here this evening. Uh, speaking of seeing one another, uh, we suggest that you use speaker view for this hour. Uh, in your Zoom window uh, up to the upper right, you should see a little view button and we re strongly recommend you go to, uh, to speaker if you're in gallery view, if you're in speaker view, that's just fine. Uh, also, we'd like to encourage you to use the chat for questions. You will be muted during this presentation and uh, but we'd love to uh, see your comments and your questions and we're gonna leave time at the end for questions, um, but let's do that through the, the chat at the bottom of the screen, please. Uh, great. So this is the last of four readings in this Odyssey series. We're thrilled to have Ming Fong Ho and Kenneth McLean here tonight to read a bit from their work and to talk about their own Odysseys. Our moderator is Edward Hauer, and in a moment, Edward will give Ming Fong and Ken uh, the, the introductions they deserve and lead us through the hour. But before I hand you over, I want to say a few words about Ithaca City of Asylum, or ICOA. For those of you who don't know us, we provide refuge here in Ithaca for writers and artists who face persecution or physical danger in their home countries. We connect them with employment and housing and legal services. We also try to provide the financial and logistical and professional and emotional support they need, uh, often coming out of very difficult circumstances. And we speak up from time to time about the importance of free expression and the crucial role that the arts play in society. Support from this, from you people, from our amazing Ithaca community makes all of this possible. And if you're in a position to donate, please, uh, in, a, in a moment, I will put a link to our donations page in the chat, uh, make it easy for you to go there. Uh, and I know that many of you have given already, and I thank you very much for that. I want to give a quick news update before we get into our program. Uh, our current artist in residence, the Nicaraguan cartoonist Pedro Molina, who arrived in December 2018, is just finishing up his time with us, starting in fact, on June 1st, he will jump from Ithaca College, where he's been teaching, to Cornell, where he'll be a visiting scholar in the Latin American Studies program, supported by a fellowship from the Artist Protection Fund. We are very, very pleased to have helped Pedro and his family find a way to stay in Ithaca for at least another year. ICOA is facing its own transition. When Pedro's term ends at the end of the month, so will Ithaca College's support for our program. They've been very hit very hard by this uh, pandemic and the budgetary crisis that that has caused. Our friends at Cornell recently asked us to help welcome a couple of scholars who are fleeing danger in their home countries. We're happy to take that on. We have a long history of working with Cornell and we hope to do more with them in the future. I wanna thank our sponsors tonight for this program in reverse alphabetical order just to mix things up. They are the Tompkins County Public Library, Story House Ithaca, the Odyssey Bookstore, the Ithaca College Department of Writing, Global Cornell, the Cornell Migrations Initiative, and Buffalo Street Books. We are grateful for their help, especially spreading the word about this series. I've been very pleased with the, with the number of people who've come. I also want to thank the Community Arts Partnership of Tompkins County, which has helped to publicize tonight's event and also provided a little financial help as well. Finally, thanks to Katie Fontana from the library, who's in the cockpit again tonight, making sure this thing flies right. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce my friend Edward Hauer. In addition to serving on the ICOA board for the last 18 years, Edward has published nine novels, two books of stories, and a book of essays and travel writing. He's also an editor at Cuba Lake, Lake Books. He has lived and taught all over the world, and we are lucky that he landed here. Thank you, Edward, and thank you all for coming. Uh, Edward, you are muted. How about now? Am I muted now? 
we hear you loud and clear now. Thanks. Good. Okay. Well, let me start again. Good evening, everybody. Thank you again for coming. I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, we have two wonderful writers tonight, both good friends of mine, uh, Min Fong Ho and Ken McLean. I'm going to introduce Min Fong first and have her write, have her read and speak to you, and then I'll introduce Ken. Min Fong Ho was born in Myanmar of ethnic Chinese parents, raised in Thailand and educated in Taiwan and at Cornell, where she completed an MFA in creative writing. She's the author of 11 books, some of them for children and beautifully illustrated, some for young adults, and all of them set in Southeast Asia, including Cambodia, where she worked in a refugee camp uh, along the Thai border. Her books have been translated into many languages and have won many awards in the US and abroad, including the Best Books for Young Adults Award from the American Library Association. And here she's going to be reading from uh, her book, The Clay Marble, and talking a bit about her experience uh, writing that. Okay, go ahead, Min Fong. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Edward, and um, Jonathan, and the folks at, how do you say it? A-I-O-C? Well, whatever it is. Icoa. Icoa, thank you. Icoa, Icoa, okay. Um, I was looking over the title of the series today, and you know, I was thinking it feels, <laughs> a little nerve wracking to be talking about things that are so close to home. I mean, literally, emotionally. Um, tomorrow is a big day for me. I am actually going on a trip. And this is the first trip I have taken outside of Ithaca since the pandemic began. And I think it's probably the longest I've ever stayed put in Ithaca. So with the sense of a trip always comes a sense of uh, travel anxiety. And, you know, I can look outside, I see the grass, the nice trees, blossoming peonies. Um, and then I feel a kind of dread um, because, I don't know, somehow I have this sense of foreboding that, you know, I'm not coming back. This is any sense of every time I, I leave home or, or place that I sense or think of as home and I leave it, I feel like, I may not come back. And I think that's probably part of the refugee slash immigrant uh, mentality. But um, it seems very apt that I would try to talk about home when I'm setting foot outside of this home for the first time in a long, long time. So what I'd like to do is read and read excerpts from an essay that I wrote sort of explaining why I wrote the um, the novel Clay Marble. Um, it's a young adult novel set on the Thai Cambodian border, as Edward had said, um, and it's um, it was included in this book. I think the book is sort of like for librarians or teachers or something, but it's all about it's all about writers and what they wrote and why they wrote it. So, Battling Dragons is is the book that it's included in. And I apologize if. Um, if it's a bit rough because you know I was trying to edit and compress into within 10, 12 minutes. So here it is. There's a massive old white pine tree that grows in a corner of our backyard here in Ithaca. Every summer it shades a sandbox where our two kids used to play and where I would read. One winter morning after a heavy snowstorm, the lowest branch of this old pine suddenly broke off under the burden of the new snow. From the kitchen window, I heard a loud splintering sound, then the crash as it hit the ground, crushing the little sandbox. I rushed outside to look at the tree, and there in the tree trunk where the branch had been ripped off was a dark, deep rot, so soft that I could have plunged my hand in and scooped out moist pulp. It looked as if the tree was rotten to the core. I stared at it and thought, that's me. But why? After all, hadn't things been going reasonably well for me? Graduate school, marriage, children, and now our own home. 
Why did it feel so wrong? If I had to answer that in one word, I would say now, Cambodia. But I did not realize it then. That winter, Cambodia was as hidden and buried in me as the rot in the old pine tree. I'm not Cambodian, had never even set foot in Cambodia all the first 15 years that I grew up in neighboring Thailand and Myanmar or Burma. All I had done was to take part in some relief work on the Thai Khmer border in the 1980s when the huge influx of refugees from the harsh Pol Pot regime uh, flooded into Thailand. The relief work itself was straightforward enough. I helped set up supplementary feeding centers for the malnourished kids in the refugee camps along the Thai border. Basically, I was like the head cook for about 3,000 kids. Um, and it consisted of buying truckloads of vegetables and rice and charcoal, getting the stuff delivered to the thatched kitchens every few miles and overseeing the distribution of the cooked food to the long lines of children waiting under the hot sun. It was long, it was tiring work, but not particularly difficult. Plenty of other people, the surgeons and nurses, the UNICEF field staff, even the military patrol on both sides of the border had much more grueling jobs, which they seemed to perform efficiently. And yet I hadn't been able to do my work properly. I remember being erratic, moody, angry, disoriented. It was like living inside an emotional minefield. Eventually, I quit and returned to graduate school at Cornell and resumed normal life until that old pine tree broke. Somehow staring at the rot inside that tree made me think of Cambodia to remember what life was like on that border. I did remember, but I had tried not to. The dead and the dying, the starving and the shooting, the pain and the suffering, the total senselessness of it all. Why had it happened? Why was it still happening? And why was it inflicted even onto the children? I remember my first glimpse of the Thai Cambodian border at Nong Jan camp. There had been tall watchtowers of split bamboo erected where guards with rifles would make sure the refugees couldn't cross over to Thailand. If and I climbed to the top of the watchtower and I could see thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, like a churning brown ocean stretched out in every direction, as far as the eye could see. Growing up in Bangkok, I had seen beggars on the street and sometimes severely malnourished babies of the nomadic hill tribes in northern Thailand. But never, never had I seen such abject mystery on such a massive scale. It was, it was overwhelming. Yet seeing the refugees somehow confirmed one of my most deep rooted fears that one's regular life could be so suddenly and drastically disrupted. I come from a Chinese immigrant family and I'm used to hearing stories of how, for example, my mother had left her childhood home in Shanghai one summer day and was never able to return because the Japanese had occupied their house. When she finally went back, about 40 years later, after the Sino-Japanese War, the communist takeover, the Second World War, her house had long since been burnt to the ground. She had not even been able to locate her mother's grave site. Like my mother and her family, these Khmer refugees had been living quietly one day with the rumblings of war only a distant reality. And the next day, everything had changed. They had to move, they had to leave behind, not only a lifetime, of possessions, but everything they were familiar with, language, culture, family, country, in a very literal way, none of them could ever go home again. I think in retrospect, I'd always felt a dread of such sudden disruption in my own life. It meant that I could have very little control over my own destiny because the big things, like when I might be uprooted and where I might be able to go afterwards, were completely beyond my control. This is not humility, it's a sense of enforced helplessness. And looking at the broken limb of that pine tree, I thought of the dislocation of the refugees on the border. It was no wonder that I felt an instant kinship with them, especially with the children, see, since they reminded me so much of myself at that age. I noticed that they played with toys that were similar to what I used to play with. Fish, sort of like, like angel-shaped fish, angelfish 
woven from strips of banana leaves, little trucks from tin cans, and everywhere the little dolls and animals shaped from clay. If I had been just a few years younger, I might have been their playmate, sharing their toys and their games. Instead, separated by a few years and an arbitrary twist of history, we had diverged into such different paths, they to endure war and famine, I to watch them endure. But they had endured, these sweet, tough kids, tougher by far than I could ever be. They had endured, and I'd almost cracked under the strain of just watching them endure. As the memories came flooding back, one particular one bubbled to the surface. So one day I was finishing my lunch, peeling a tangerine in one of the malnutrition wards where I worked. I noticed the little girl staring so intently, not at me, but at my tangerine. So I gave her half of it. In return, she slipped something into my hand. It was a marble made of mud, a clay marble, smooth and perfect. And thinking of that clay marble again, I realized that if she could shape such a perfect marble, out of the chaos of her own life, then maybe I too could try and shape something out of my own confusion. And so I followed her example and started to shape my own clay marble. I started molding it around the little girl. And since I wanted to befriend her but could find no way to anymore, aside from making up a story about her, I started writing that story. I named her Dara and eventually she took over the whole story. I did not know the word empowerment then, but looking back, I realized that by empowering Dara with the strength to want to go home and to do it, I was in a way empowering myself. I had started the, the story that winter in Ithaca, but did not finish it until much later when we had moved to Laos, just across the border from Thailand and Cambodia, because my husband had found a job there. And one of the deepest satisfactions came after the story was almost finished. Uh, we lived in Laos, Cambodia's communist neighbor for about two, three years. And in Laos, I saw that life had resumed its old age pattern. Men plowed their paddy fields, young monks swept temple compounds, women clicked the looms as they wove checkered sarongs underneath stilted houses. And the children, like children everywhere, were spinning tops, flying kites, making marbles out of clay. I wrote my editor with um, some of the, the, the last revisions, and she was in, in New York. And this, this is from that letter. It has been a gift, Margaret, to be able to finish up the story here, with the swallows diving in arcs above the rice fields right outside my window, the mango trees, the stones throw from my desk. Everything is a seamless whole. The fields, the story, the past, the present, the US, Southeast Asia, Dara, myself. I didn't make it up. It was not some solipsistic nightmare I had stuck in a cold house in upstate New York. It all happened. It all exists. It is all here. Um, so the clay marble was published, translated, and I, I read from it. Um, I remember one classroom, just stepping into a classroom, rushed out late, and there was about 50 kids, and they said, the teacher said, um, oh, well, there she is, the writer herself. Here, why don't you read what we were just reading up to? And she read this passage, and I, <laughs> I thought, God, this is good, and I started crying. It was very embarrassing. But anyway... Many years later, we're in Ithaca again. Just today, I made a list of the major times we have left Ithaca. Five times we left, each time thinking it would be permanent the last time. But six times I have returned. My journey was not as adventurous as Ulysses was, and my return to Ithaca was hardly as triumphant, nor as bloody, thank goodness, as his. But it is a homecoming just the same. Ithaca has become my home, not because I was born here or grew up here, not even because I actively chose to move here, but simply because I have learned to make a home wherever I am. And yes, the old pine tree is still here, a little hollowed out perhaps, but it's still growing, still sending roots deep into the earth and branches up into the sky. Thank you.
Edward, we'll need to unmute you. There we go. Have I unmuted? Yes. Good. Well, thank you, Min Fong. That's a, a lovely uh, essay and um, very moving, I think. Here is a copy of Min Fong's book. It may appear as if in a mirror, but there it is. It's a lovely book. I just finished reading it, in fact. And um, later we'll have some questions for Min Fong. I want to introduce our next reader now, uh, Kenneth A. McLean. Uh, he is one of the area's most distinguished writers and uh, poets and essayists. And uh, let me look and see what I've got here. And uh, he is the author of eight poetry collections and three volumes of personal essays. His latest uh, book of essays is called Color, Essays on Race, Family, and History, published by Notre Dame University Press, which has also reprinted his first collection, Walls. Ken taught in Cornell's English department for 34 years. And now that he's retired, he is the W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of Literature Emeritus. The essay he's going to read tonight is one that he wrote especially for this program. Okay, Ken. Thank you, Edward. And I wanna just say that Ming Fong, that was just so gorgeous and so generative and just so poignant. Thank you. I'm just Thank you. Happy here. Thank you, Ken. I'm reading this with a little bit of trepidation. It still needs some work, but I wanted to write something for you all and I wanted it to be short enough so I could do it. The graduation. Many years ago, I gave the commencement address at Auburn Correctional Facility, the oldest continuous maximum security prison in the United States, opened in 1816. Located in a small city in upstate New York, bordered by the proverbial railroad tracks and a highway, the prison sits at the crosswords of yes and no, as one inmate described it. Amazingly, that commencement occurred 30 years ago, and it was my first visit to a penitentiary. In the ensuing years, I have returned to Auburn Correctional Facility with some regularity to attend the odd class, class as a lecturer, to offer a seminar on the personal essay, and to help students with their writing. Most recently, I have worked with a group of very talented men to help edit their literary magazine. I was asked because the inmates, whom we call students, wanted their journal to get more circulation in the outside world and to examine themes that resonate beyond the reality of their confinement. The magazine we produce is a good one, full of fine poems, essays, and artwork. Many of the pieces involve the prison and the writer's experience there, which is to be expected, but not all. Some poems celebrate the outside world, memories of school antics, one's last taste of curried chicken, a wife who was holding a family together, doing what I should be doing, as one writer lamented. Not surprisingly, some of the commentary is brutal. Although it was 30 years ago, I still recall seeing the prison's massive 40 foot walls with its no nonsense guard cowers and the terror it induced. To calm myself, I kept repeating Rilke's elegiac line, sorrow is thick on the land. And yet even Rilke, the greatest poet of the heart's interiority seemed tentative, even trifling. The prison invites the mind's involvement and yet it throws one's surmise back on oneself like a useless mirror. People can die here. People can also live. And yet the one unassailable truism beyond the prison's abject calculus that human beings should put other human beings in changes, in cages, I'm sorry, is this. One is either within the walls or outside of them. When the prison gates cling shut, you are inside. If the idea of freedom touted in every pain to democracy and every 4th of July speech seems abstract, it is not so here. Freedom is everything outside. Outside is life, one of my prison poets told me. Outside is Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Ralph Ellison, shit, grit, and mother wit, and a slow dance with a bitchin' girl. 
In a recent essay I received for the journal, one student described what it felt like to leave the prison for a funeral. How the trees were gangly, how his old city now had new buildings. My neighborhood erupted, he exclaimed, and how a group of children seemed as carefree, carefree as a field of, of dandelions. He'd been in the prison for many years. His brother had died of narcotics, and he was thankful that the institution let him go to the memorial, not a small concession. The prison administration allowed the author one hour. If the funeral went on beyond that time, he would have to depart, no matter what the situation. If the ceremony began late and the casket hadn't yet arrived, it was still only one hour. The inmate, of course, remained in chains and was accompanied by two guards for the entire service. It was humbling, he confessed. I'm sorry, it was humiliating, he confessed but he was glad for that bittersweet outing. I had done bad things. They didn't have to let me go, he said. On that first visit with my graduate speech in my pocket, everything's thick with possibility, terror and menace. The graduates initially perplexed me. Many of them had come from the city I had escaped, but they had lived far different lives. And yet they welcomed me, the poet, the speaker, the one who had somehow avoided the streets. My brother Paul, however, might well have been in Auburn. He lived hard, partied hard, and was often in trouble. Paul died of alcoholism at 29. And whenever I go to Auburn or any prison, I see my brother in so many of the young men. His loping walk, his easygoing smile, his recalcitrance, which was really Paul's way of saying, fuck you, I don't care, or I care too much. I recall how proud the students were to receive their community college degrees. The great gravitas of the valedictorian as he spoke powerfully about what his education meant to him and how this was the first time he had ever done anything of merit in the world. I noticed how physically small he appeared. He seemed too delicate for his booming edicts. His long braids stuffed into his mortarboard, his hands steady as a metronome, his whole aspect a curious congress of the chaotic, and yet he spoke beautifully. He enthusiastically thanked his teachers for their great interest in him, and I realized that he had much more belief in us than we had in our own achievements. He was the flush and bled affirmation that the system was ultimately beneficent, and his new beginning was a testimony to this. I was lost, but now I'm found, he even stated. Few of us in the audience, I hazard, were so assured about our own prospects. For whatever else we had accomplished, the good job, the healthy marriage, the tidy apartment, we were out of prison honoring others, but something certainly had gone terribly amiss and it might happen again. Human vulnerability can't be assuaged by iron bars and those who have truly suffered know that suffering never stops and pain sadly often increases and whatever good was happening here, no matter how evangelizing our speech making, might never outdistance out those demons that inhabit us. On the dais, those men receiving degrees were all innocents once, and some of them quite truthfully might be innocent now. I'd suggest that Auburn walls were so immense because at bottom, we know that there is no true separation between those without the walls and those within them. If the walls were a thousand feet tall, we could still confront ourselves in those forlorn cells in all our splendor and horror. It would be comforting if the potential murderer were a completely different species or hailed from a distant planet, if he had 10 12s or spikes for arms. But how many of us have struck someone in anger? How many of us on some dismal morning have found ourselves wondering what happened in last night's debauchery? How many crimes through pure luck or a good lawyer have we evaded? Extraterrestrials don't maim children, we do. After I finished my short commencement comments, I looked about the room and realized that there were pitifully few people in the audience, just a handful of onlookers who had made the long bus ride from New York City or Buffalo. I saw one couple 
in ill-fitting clothing who seemed almost blinded by the rigors of the ceremony, the academic regalia of the 10 college teachers, the roses on the linen-laden tables, the buffet, which was really just a bigger portion of the usual jailhouse food, and the two members of Governor Mario Cuomo's staff, the distinguished state assemblyman, Arthur Reeve, and the warden, a truly well-meaning fellow. He, like Assemblyman Eve, was clearly at home with the bureaucracy and the intricacies of thrown together celebrations. But the rest of us were not convinced. The students were congratulatory. They found the ceremony to be moving. And since they'd never witnessed the pageantry of the many colored academic robes and the suddenly very dignified presentment of their teachers, they had reason to rejoice. I was still pondering the prison's historical antecedents. The fact that just a few blocks away in a lovely mansion, William Seward, the former governor of New York and later secretary of state in President Abraham's Lincoln administration had championed the creation of Auburn Prison, then an act of immense progressivism. And just a few miles further away, the proverbial stone's throw, that other Auburn luminary, Harriet Tubman, in a much less prominent house, contemplated the indefatigable struggle to shepherd slaves to freedom. Slaves were rumored to be more scared of her than slavery. And I must admit, all this oddity and pomp in this confounding place was poignant. The men made it so. Even the most cynical among us, when seeing the new graduates, those who had been given so little and achieved so much, found ourselves inspired. Still, no matter the enormity of the students' achievements, at the end of the ceremony, the prison must quickly reassert its sense of control and the prisoners must return to their cells, reduced to their nameless, undifferentiated selves. For the prison, individuality equals agency and agency equals power and the possibility for revolt. Yet this day, Assemblyman Eve and I had a different agenda. We wanted the graduates to have one day that was truly special. While Assemblyman Eve and I were sitting at the table with the warden, the guard in charge asked the warden if he should do the usual to check the, that the prisoners had no car contraband, which meant that they would be strip searched, probed hither and yon like animals. Assemblyman Eve and I quickly spoke up since we knew that nothing could have been introduced to the prisoners in the way of weapons. Everyone had been severely searched upon entering the prison. Everyone watched, one watched literally from the moment they entered the facility to the moment they came to the ceremony. The strip search was merely a way of reminding the students that they were inmates, education or no. This is a special day. Please let the men savor it, Arthur Eve said. I'm certain Governor Cuomo would want it no other way. The warden knew from whom he worked and he joined in our affirmation with a slight nod to our ingenuity. The men could travel back to their cells, the new graduates unscathed for one day. It was such a small triumph and it seemed as earth shattering as if we had just discovered penicillin. Interestingly, Inmates still recall that graduation 30 years later. Thanks for speaking and standing up for us, one man serving a life sentence told me a few months ago when I was back at the prison. I had forgotten the entire incident. Few remembered it as if it were yesterday. In prison, things take on momentous weight and the smallest disruption of the ordinary can become epiphanic. Yet the thing I do reflect about that commencement was, very, was one very strong inmate, a bodybuilder, who upon leaving the celebration, gently picked up a rose from the table in an unadorned paper cup. I watched as he handled it with the tenderness of a lover, the red rose coddled in his massive arms like a young baby. He took it over to the bathroom and watered it, the red rose's petals luminous in the prison chapel and I was reminded of the painter Jonas Vermeer and the beauty of the roses, redness against his dark black arms. The inn might, might never see a rose again in the wild, but this day he held it and it was loved. 
That commencement day, the drive back home was particularly poignant. The smell of manure, I'm the president in the May air, my eyes glistening with tears. As luck would have it, my wife held me long and hard. She could sense that this day was particularly troublesome. She said little, knowing as she always does, that little could be said. A cardinal was singing, his voice spiraling like a stairway to the heavens. The house needed painting, the walls were mildewed. There was much to be done to keep our house standing. I had work to do, much work, and yet I couldn't help but think back to that splendid rose and its slow passage back to the cell block, the young man so intent on protecting its tender buds. The rose would not live long, I knew. What had he done? What had we done? My life seems oddly singular. It's orchestrations, my beautiful wife, my good job, my niggling but loving friends, the books I hadn't read, those I will and will not write, all the congealed sense and nonsense that make up a life. There were regrets, yes, and kindnesses too, but I was free. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. That's a very moving uh, piece again. Uh, very two very excellent uh, essays uh, about freedom, about uh, moving in and out of different worlds. I have a question for those of you. Uh, I have, in fact, worked in a refugee camp in Uganda uh, and know something about that. And I worked with Ken at Auburn Prison. and. Uh, taught there for six semesters. Uh, and like both of you, I have tried to write about it. One of the problems I had was try to find some sort of hope and optimism in settings which were pretty grim, actually. Uh, I came out of them uh, feeling, uh, as Ken does, that I was free and that uh, I had done something well. But how do you write about, S, about settings, which are essentially grim and difficult, and find hope for your readers. Uh, Min Fan, you want to start? Um, well, coincidentally or not, I also worked in Auburn prison, um, ah. not for very long, but I was a translator from Chinese, um, from a Chinese prisoner or two into English and vice versa when they came up before the parole board. And that was a very interesting experience. But the question you raised about how do you depict um, scenes and people that you know are pretty grim without demeaning them. Um, I know that when I started remembering about Cambodia and writing about it, I took a lot of, I had taken a lot of photographs of people at the refugee camps, especially kids. And um, it was strange. I. I saw that I had, without really realizing it, only taken pictures of happy kids. There were so many, and you know, this is just miserable kids who had lost their limbs and everything. And I net had never pointed a camera at any of them. I didn't have a picture of them. Somehow, I think I must have felt that, you know, they have lost so much. I cannot bear to take away what little of themselves and their, um, I don't know, it's not a sense of privacy, dignity by pointing my camera at them. So yes, it's, it's really hard um, to do that. Um, I think writing is a lot easier than taking, taking photos. Um, my son is a photojournalist in war zones and um, I think he had a very hard time in Afghanistan and Beirut and so on. So I, I'm glad I wasn't um, I wasn't a photographer at least. But it's your your poem or essay, Ken, was really powerful. Um, and the inside outside uh, dichotomy, I thought was 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 really captured the difference between us and them. And yet there is no us and there is no them. So. Hope I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, yeah, I think that's good. That's uh, useful. And Ken, what, how do you bring hope into your writing about our prisons and other places which are 
uh, the dim. Here are your books. Uh, I didn't show them before. Um, so when you write, uh, you want to make the reader feel optimistic. How do you do that? Well, first of all, let me say that I'm always impressed with how, for example, at Auburn, the guys I work with have incredible sense of hope. You know, I think what happens very often is I'm the one who's sort of more sort of mm. the sourpuss, you know. Um, and part of that, I think, comes from the fact that they, you know, the light's going on. They finally have been, in some sense, corroborated in a way that they haven't at, at, at other points in their lives. Um, and uh, I think it's just that. I mean, I keep, I'm amazed at the, um, at the resiliency of human beings. I'm just amazed that, that people get up every morning giving all the crap that we face, you know, and others face, and they do it and they do it. And, you know, um, Ming Fong, that, that thing of that, that gift of that child, I mean, they, people in some sense measure up under the most um, horrific of circumstances. And I don't see how you can live in the world and not in some sense uh, be, be awed by that. That's not, and again, you, you can tell I'm, I suffer from one big thing and that's um, a 21st century romantic in a very unromantic time. But I keep, I, I, I mean, I think it seems to me, um, the other thing is you can't read literature in some sense and not in some sense rejoice. It's just, it, it's just amazing in some sense how, how we're able to sort of find in, in what seems un, the unspeakable, just uh, time and time again, examples of, of people transcending. Yeah, I found this hope in the refugees and the prisoners that they were so eager to get at literature, to read uh, material, which uh, they thought was about them. And that's what good literature always does. It makes you feel that this uh, writer is writing about me. And they felt very much elevated by this. Now, uh, John is, uh, had, has been able to look at the uh, chat. No, I have, a, I have a question here. This is for Ken from, uh, he has sent it to me. How did poetry uh, become transformed into essay in your writing, especially in view of the poetic nature of your essays? Okay, uh, let me first say that I started writing poems uh, I didn't realize this, this had happened, but I started to write poems after my brother died. And I, in fact, haven't written, I may have written two poems since he's died. And that was many years ago in 82. Uh, I have to write. I mean, it's the only way I understand the world. And luckily, um, I found a way to do that. I mean, I think that uh, there are obviously better writers in the world than I am, but you know, I do the best I can with what I have. Um, the one good thing, it's funny, where I went to school, we were only allowed to write a paragraph. That was it. I, I remember graduate school was really tough because you were supposed to write these 20 page papers and I had never written anything longer than five pages, right? So that kind of compression, it seems to me that poems um, demand right, has worked for me. Plus it's just the, the lyricism of that. It's just kind of wonderful. Okay. Uh, uh, I can butt in with a question perhaps? Please. Yeah. Um, I'm curious from having uh, heard both of you that you've taken these, you know, the theme of this series is odysseys, you know, kind of a prompt. And that has to do with this sort of travel all, you know, all over the place and different stops along the way. But in both of your readings tonight, you talked about a moment and Ken used the word epiphanic and you know that moment where everything crystallized and Ming Fong yours with the branch falling, that moment brought everything together. The clay marble brought everything together. The moment of graduation brought everything together. The tending to the rose brought everything together. And I guess I'd love to hear from both of you, how trustworthy is that um, that relationship between the, like that crystalline symbol or moment and, and the messiness of the journey. And Fong, what do you say? Who wants to start? Sorry. 
So Ken, do you want to go first? No, no go, uh, Mima, go ahead, please. Um, well, that clay marble, um, you know, I mean, I, I go to schools and I talk about, you know, the things that I write about and um, I tell kids that, you know, um, I, I'm a fiction writer and, but everything I, <laughs> I write about is, is, is true, except for the facts. Um, so what, what is made up? What is absolutely factual? You know, um, that line becomes more and more blurred and less and less valid as one tries to make sense, as Ken was saying, of things that you know are really hard to digest, to assimilate. Um, and I don't know. Um, I know that I felt like I was somehow cheating because I had clay marbles that I had made myself because I lost the original one. And I would bring them to class and say, this is the clay marble that that little girl gave me. And they would pass it around, you know, and stuff. And, mm. but yet, you know, it's, it wasn't false because it was, I don't know if it's clay marbles can have a spirit, but it was the spirit of the clay marble and kids felt closer to all those little refugee kids because they were holding something tactile um, that, that was a sharing experience. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't trust fiction. I don't know anything about poetry, um, but I've taken to reading pretty much nonfiction rather than trying to write it because that line of, you know, I think it comes from a song, um, making up your memories and thinking they have found you. Um, that's, that is very slippery. Um, and I think that's called the creative process in some way. <laughs> I guess. I think that's a good answer then, uh, uh -huh. Ken, I thought that your image of the man, the great big guy, holding on to that little rose and he knew that he uh it wouldn't last very long uh but he wanted to treasure this moment i thought that was a wonderful image to bring everything together into your piece um this is a poetic technique i think you have learned and brought over into your prose style am i right yeah but i think it was also that i must admit when i saw that and it's i almost find myself crying reading that i just can't <laughs> You know, when we talk about, people are very glib and they say, oh, you know, you know, they, they shouldn't allow prisoners to have this, that, and the other. And if you saw that, mm -hmm. you would understand what it means to take somebody's freedom away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this guy may never see a real, that might be the closest he's going to get to seeing a real rose. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what, I guess that's, I guess that's what I'm looking for. I am looking for those moments, right? Right, which in, in some sense carry the weight of all this stuff. Part of it, I, I must admit, I write very much. If I were, if I could have been, I would have been a jazz musician, mm -hmm. right? So my tendency is to try to, in some sense, you know, set out something and then try, if I can, to dig deeper and sort of get further into things and, and find things that, that, that give a kind of gravitas and a kind of um, um, weight to thing. And those things, and if I didn't, by the way, if I didn't see these, these kinds of images, I don't know if I could survive. Yeah, the images give meaning to the concepts all around them. And I had a similar experience in India visiting a women's prison where the women were allowed to keep their children until they were six years old. And many of them had been born in the prison. And they were drawing pictures of cats and dogs and goats and camels. These were the animals that were all over the place outside the prison. These children had never seen a cat or a dog. Uh, and yet they were just enjoying themselves like crazy, uh, drawing pictures of them with pictures from textbooks and so forth. Uh, and that image has stayed with me uh, for many years. Uh, so I understand how a single image can stand for a great deal in uh in your writing john do you have another question off the chat 
uh, room. Or shall I ask one? No, no, I'm I'm begging okay. you. Uh, let me to uh, <laughs> let me ask uh, Min Fong uh, about uh, the clay marble. And you've written a lot about children and young adults making new homes for themselves after being displaced from their original homes. So what are some of the qualities of home that they have found, at least temporarily? And for you, uh, what makes Ithaca a home? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think language. I mean, certainly I feel comfortable speaking English. Um, I, I lived in Switzerland for about three years when my husband had a job there and I tried to learn French and, you know, they, they stare at you as if you just climbed down from the trees in France if you don't speak it well. So I didn't like living there. I don't think I could ever live in a place where I didn't speak the language um, fluently and where I couldn't eavesdrop. I love eavesdropping on people's conversations and things. And if I don't know what they're saying, I feel very left out and isolated. So I have been, I have made a home in Thailand and Singapore, not Switzerland. Um, and and I've, I feel at home here, I think because it's, um, it, there are so many choices and there's nobody telling you exactly what is right and wrong except for my husband when he's trying to do my computer help. But, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a very open kind of place. And I love, of course, the space. And um, I don't know, I, I, I love plants. I like growing things. So anything that I can grow, anywhere that I can grow things that I like, you know, whether they're bulbs or rhizomes or um, kick chickens or children or whatever, as to see things grow makes it home. That's why I think the sense of being imprisoned or in a refugee camp, I mean, it cannot be home because there is no will, no, no freedom to it, no openness to it, no, no growth. Um, and I think that must be one of the most horrible things about being a refugee or being imprisoned, that you cannot make a home where you are really. One in your book, uh, The Clay Marble, the refugees, uh, one of the first things they want to do is to find some rice seed and stick it in the ground. Uh, this is very important to them. They, the rice, they may never see the rice grow, but they want to put those seeds in the ground, even in a camp. I think that's one of the more moving parts of your book, it, growing things uh, and growing food, especially, is very important. And if you can get food from the ground, you're, you're home. Uh, Ken, I'm going to ask you something that Min Fong spoke about before. I know from writing personal essays, uh, sometimes things happen 20, 30, 40 years ago. I can't remember exactly what happened. I certainly can't recall dialogue, things that I have actually said or people have said to me. Um, but my imagination pops in there and provides me with, uh, I suppose, inspiration. Um, but the age old question, do you feel an obligation to write totally accurate truth, verisimilitude, uh, or does a personal essay involve more than that? Uh, perhaps some creativity. Well, to the degree that I'm, if I were writing uh, an actual, something that wasn't a memoir, if I were writing a piece of history, I think you need to be accurate. Um, mm -hmm. I must admit that I do think one of the things that's really hard about experience is that we tend to act on what we believed happened, whether it did or didn't. I mean, this is one of the problems of human history, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, you know, many times you have a situation where somebody said, well, this happened, you know, and, and this is why I did this. And you have whole movements, right? And then you go back and you, look and you say, well, that didn't really happen that way. People thought it did or they wanted it to happen that way. Um, I do try as best I can, first of all, um, to be as accurate as I can be. Um, I don't mean to lie, um, but I got to admit, I. some people used to call me uh, 
uh, they used to call me hyperbole man, and that's not probably too oh, far. Oh, yeah, I would never call you that. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I might like being called a hyperbole woman. <laughs> I'd like, oh, uh, or enthusiastic, I think is about. Yeah. <laughs> Edward, if you don't mind, uh, I'll interject. Uh, we, we just have a couple minutes before the end of the hour, and which has gone by very quickly. But I, I wanted to sneak in one more sort of question slash comment, and maybe start with with Ken. Uh, in in both of your readings and what you've been talking about, refugee camp prison, people are confined, and we've and you're just talking about how how uh, you can't have a home in that situation. But life does not stop. And, uh, and that's always been one of the most moving things for me for refugees and working with the Ithaca City of Asylum people who have fled. And they're in this kind of suspended animation, but it's not like their lives have stopped. It, this is still the story, the trying to, you know, being in some completely difficult and, and alien place is their life too. Um, and I don't know if that's something that that you've thought about. Uh, it's more of an observation, but if you uh, maybe can, if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, in pr prison is the most dramatic of that. You, your life, it's not like your life ends when you go in and then resumes when you come out. You still have a life when you're there. I mean, I think, I think for me, one, and again, I'm, you know, to me, what's astonishing is not only that people live there, but but they live with real sense. To, uh, many of the guys have, have a, a kind of sense of community that I haven't seen among men. It's not the, you know, you, you always hear prison often being right this hyper masculine place. But and in my classes, the sort of affection, the open um, acknowledgement of male affection is something I've never seen before anywhere. Right, and I say that because I think what again. Remember, we're also talking about. I mean, the uh, people who are at in 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 the Auburn program are really quite brilliant. It's like the Harvard right of of prison programs, and I'm saying that um, it's very hard to get in the program. People are, are are pretty smart, and they work real hard. But to me, I think the thing that I find most moving is that people's sense of, for example, someone will be, uh, they'll know somebody and that person will be transferred and they'll never see you know, him again. And this happens all the time, right? And I think that's something I've never, I've never confronted, I can't quite, and it's really hard for us to teach, right? Who do have these connections with people, right? And that they have to, in some sense, understand that things change and they change radically. Right. And I think that to me is, I mean, it just seems to me that they have resources that I certainly don't have. Uh, Edward, do you have any final thoughts? I mean, I, well, I, just to thought, I think Ken is for... right. You do develop resources under difficult uh, conditions. And Min Fong uh, certainly knows this from working in refugee camps. People, it brings out things in people which uh, on the outside we rarely see. A uh, sense of confinement brings out the humanness in a lot of us, which we don't bother to show uh, in ordinary life. And both of these essays have brought these, uh, this idea out that people can, uh, always retain a sense of humanity, a sense of a heightened humanity, perhaps when they are thrown together in uh, difficult situations. So I really am grateful for both of you for reading this uh, terrific essays, which uh, really had quite a lot to do with each other, even though graphically they were and their resilience. And maybe I just step and thank you all, a wonderful audience, for being here tonight and for taking time out on a warm Tuesday. Uh, and we hope you'll. Uh, go to our website, Ithaca City of Asylum. I want to thank our sponsors again and Community Arts Partnership. And uh, good evening to everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.